BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. We're uh, also uh, once again doing on our Shabbat here our 613 commandments that were given by God. It's called 613 uh, Mitzvah, Experience of a Lifetime. Going on to slide number two, as we start each one of these um, sections of the commandments, we always start out with Matthew 5, 17 and 18, because Yeshua did not make a new covenant. He renewed his covenant. And people say that we need that the, we're no longer under the law. Well, let's see what Yeshua himself says, because Yeshua is Messiah, Paul is not. Okay? Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. Verse 18, 518, Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. And since we still have the book of Revelation, to play out in our lives and the seven seals and the seven shofars and the seven bowls. Um, everything has not happened yet. So what we can fully say is that God's commandments are still in effect today and we are still to keep them. All right? That is from Yeshua the Messiah. And going on to the next slide, we're in slide number three. And the next thing that we always hear from people is that, you know, the law is not for the Gentile. Well, let's see what God thinks of that. Okay, um, let's look at Leviticus 24, 16. Leviticus 24, 16. And whoever blasphemes the name of Jehovah must be put to death. The entire community must stone him. The foreigner as well as the citizen is to be put to death if he blasphemes the name. So very simply, how are we going to stone a foreigner if he doesn't know, he or she doesn't know what blaspheming the name of God is, okay? So that means that they do know and that God has the same laws, the same blessings, and the same curses for both Jew and Gentile. The difference between the Jew and the Gentile is just a bloodline. The Jew is from the seed of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And if you're one of those silly little people that says, well, the Jews were just from Yehuda, it's a term, okay? Just like somebody is from the Broncos. That doesn't mean they're actually a horse, okay? They're a football team that's hopefully going to win the Super Bowl uh, tomorrow or two days from now, okay? So here, it doesn't actually mean that they're a horse. And somebody is a panther, it doesn't mean they're actually a panther, okay? So here, one from you, when we say a Jew, that means all of Israel. It's a term. It's a title, okay, for a grouping of people, just like somebody is a Met, somebody is a Yankee, somebody is a Nick, somebody is a Net, somebody is a Bronco, somebody is a Panther, doesn't mean they actually are a Met or a Yankee. They could be from Cuba and play for the Yankees, okay? Going on to the next slide. 34 categories of the, the, the Torah. Torah means, it doesn't just mean law, actually it is the third meaning of it. Torah is perfect instructions from Jehovah. Torah is perfect directions from a loving Father. Torah is perfect laws to live our life by. Okay? So if you, you don't want to follow instructions, that means 
you're misinformed. You don't want to follow directions? That means you're lost. You don't want to follow the laws given by the Father? That means you're a thief. Okay? So the laws are perfect instruction, perfect directions, and perfect laws. Going on to the next slide, we are going to be starting off our categories again. What you're going to start seeing is actually some of the categories as we go through the 34 categories of the law are going to be finalized, okay? And uh, there are some categories that are very large, such as kosher, such as the laws for the temple. These categories are much larger than some of the other, other categories that we will be completing this week. I think we last week we completed um, one or two other categories. And if you missed any one of these teachings, I believe we're on th teaching number 13 of the 613 commandments, please go to our website, bethgoim.org, and you can click on the 613 uh, icon and listen to the teachings, download the PowerPoint, and if you're so led, please give a donation. Okay, category one, we're looking at uh, Yehovah. If you would turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy, Devarim 6, verse 4. Devarim, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. I'll give you a second to turn to that. The subcategory of this one is to know that God is one, a complete unity. It's a very interesting understanding because it talks about the Godhead. He is in unity with himself, not where he's standing by himself, but as we see in Bereshit 1, we're looking up Deuteronomy 6 at the moment, but if we had understood Bereshit 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. God is not talking to the angels. He's talking to his beloved son, Yeshua. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, to know that God is one in complete unity. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Elohim, Yehovah Echad. Okay, Echad means one, but Echad means one group. One group, like a group of grapes or uh, a group of people that play for a team. Okay, the Echad. The whole purpose of, you know, the people that we're talking about the Super Bowl, since it is um, two days from now, the whole idea of that team is to win. Each person will play a role because one person can't win the game by themselves. Okay, so you need everybody to be echad together, working in unity, whether you're on offense or you're on defense, working in unity to stop your opponent in a fair game and may the best team win. Okay. So Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. Echad means God is in unity. He is in unity with His Son, Yeshua. He is in unity with the Ruach HaKodesh, who does His bidding. Okay, now do we find that in a bridge Honda Shah? We're going on to the next slide. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. To know that God is in complete unity. Okay, 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. I'll give you a second to find out where it is. Okay. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse five, 4 and 5. To know that God is one in complete unity. We're reading... Uh, he wants all humanity to be delivered and to come to full knowledge of the truth. For God is one, and there is but one mediator between God and humanity, Yeshua the Messiah, himself human. So we see clearly in verse 5, for God is one. He is in unity with his Son. That means they agree 100% on everything that was written in the perfect laws of God. Okay? They are one. They are in unity. This is the beginning of the first category. Unity, and it's the same with us. We should be in unity with God's commandments, with the Word of God. From Genesis through to Revelation, we should be in unity like the Father and the Son are in complete unity. As Yeshua said, I and the Father are one. They're not one person because we see that He says He sits at the right hand of the Father. So you can't be the same person if you're sitting at the right hand hand of the Father. A lot of people don't understand that concept. I've had m many difficult discussions with Gentiles who really can't understand that very simplistic concept where Yeshua himself says, nobody gets to the Father except through me. That means there are two separate entities, but they are in unity 100%, okay, with how things are done, 
what they agree on. They don't disagree on anything. They are in unity. Verse 5, where God is one and there is but one mediator between God and humanity, Yeshua the Messiah, himself human. So he's fully God, fully human. That's why he is the son of man. He was born of woman, but he was a seed from the Ruach HaKodesh. Going on to the next category, we're going to uh, Deuteronomy 31. Please, Deuteronomy 31, category 2. This is the final in this category, the Torah, that every person shall write a scroll, a song of the Torah for himself. Okay, Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. We're talking about writing here. Okay, writing this song down that we don't forget it. Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Therefore, write this song for yourselves and teach it to the people of Israel. Have them learn it by heart so that this song can be a witness for me against the people of Israel. We were designed by Jehovah to worship, okay? I know some people think that they can't sing, like my mother said that she couldn't sing, and this was very true. But most people are designed to worship. Most people are designed that songs are very simple to remember. When you're learning um, a language, okay, I know here in America, and uh, there was a very popular show when I was growing up as a child, and I believe it's still on today, called Sesame Street, okay? And in Sesame Street, the children are taught how to sing their ABCs, okay? Also, if you're learning how to uh, speak Ivrit, they have made the same song, Aleph, Baden, Gimel, Dal, it's the same um, melody. When you have simple melodies, you remember things well, okay? Just like, you know, uh, you know, you can, I can sing a couple of notes of, you know, amazing grace. Everybody's going to start singing. It's a melody that was simple, but very good. The same thing goes here for uh, verse 19, Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Therefore, write this song for yourself and teach it to the people of Israel, having them learn it by heart so that this song can be a witness for me against the people of Israel. It's against because God, Elohim, wants you to remember this song. He wants you to write it down. He wants you to memorize it. Why? So that you can look at it and say, well, this is what God does not want. It's a witness against me so that I can stay on the narrow path. The walk, on, walk through the narrow gate that Yeshua says. Walk through the narrow gate. Okay, so the Lord is saying here, write this song and teach it to the people. Teach it to the families. Teach it to the children so that they can remember this song you know, and everybody can remember like the national anthems of every, of your country that you live in. Many people learn the Hatikva, the hope that Israel has, their national anthem. It's a very beautiful song written by a Messianic Jewish believer, okay? But it, it, songs touch something in our spirit that was designed by Jehovah that because we are designed to worship. So music is a very strong part of the Spirit of God that He gives to us. So He said to write this song because He knows that we will remember songs. And I'm sure if you're secular and you, you, you know, became a believer at a later age and even, you can remember songs. Some, you, know, you can hear a note or two of a song. Boom, it'll bring you right back to where you were. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you hear a song, oh man, I haven't heard that in a while. And you'll still be able to sing along with it. Okay? Especially Jewish people. You know, Jewish people, you, you know, they'll, they'll know every Broadway song, every hit that was a, a song. Most Jewish people will know every Barbra Streisand song, okay? They'll know every note to Fiddler on the Roof. It's something that is ingrained in us. This is why the Father who made a covenant with the Hebrew people, and He's only made a covenant with them. He didn't change His covenant. He didn't break His covenant. He never made His covenant with anybody else. He knows how He designed these people and more people in my family play music, and more people, you know, growing up, I could, I could tell you, I could sing every Rodgers and Hammerstein thing, I can sing every Broadway song. Music was such a bar, big part of our lives, even though my father 
fell away from the Lord when his father died. Okay, so the Lord knows, and all my cousins, they all know songs. But why? Because God knows his people. Now here, the key is though, writing. Writing this song for yourselves and teach it. Okay, writing. So we're going to look at writing. That is our key word, write. Going on to the Brit Hanashah, we're going to look at Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 5. Revelation 21, verse 5. Writing, okay, writing. One of, one of the most uh, phenomenal uh, messianic artists that I know and heard their music is uh, used to be Ted Pierce. His first two CDs, messianic CDs, were just, he would be able to take the words of Scripture and an incredible gifting that that man has to be able to put God's word to music. Unlike anybody else I've ever worked with in the music industry and anybody else in Christendom, beyond Hill songs, one of the most phenomenal people. Um, Josh Aaron is good, but Ted Pierce is phenomenal. You look at Holly Lewitt, Adonai, and Zealous Over Zion, just incredible, incredible music. Just taken from the words of Scripture. Revelation 21, verse 5, Then the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Also he said, Write, these words are true and trustworthy. Writing things down also uses other senses. It uses our textile sense. It uses motion. It rem it, our bodies remember how to do this motion. So writing down, so God wanted us to write this song. He wants us to write these words down so that it will testify, as we saw in the, the previous scripture, testifying against us. The same methodology through to the book of Revelation from the Torah is still what Yochanan, the Jew, the Hebrew, was being told by Yeshua the Messiah, another Hebrew, saying, write these words down. Writing the, sc the scroll down. I think we've gone through it before and one of the other things about the king. The king is to write the entire Torah. He's to copy the entire Torah for himself. One, it puts you as responsible because you've written it, you've read it, you're responsible. So the Lord is saying once again, this writing into the book of Revelation 21 verse 5, this writing makes us responsible. You're responsible for what you know. See, in Leviticus 4, chapter 4 and chapter 5, there's something called the inadvertent error. Like, you didn't know. Once you found out, you go, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, give the offering, and then you're forgiven. But writing this down now makes you responsible as his child for the information that you're writing down. So the Lord is saying here, look, I'm making everything new. Also, he said, write these words are true and trustworthy. They're trustworthy. You can trust them. They are truth. Okay? Going on to the next category, category number three. We're looking at signs and symbols. Please turn back to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. This is also part of the message tomorrow. Okay? For Shabbat. Deuteronomy 6, verse 9. Deuteronomy 6, we're now looking at signs and symbols. Signs and symbols, the, the subcategory, or the saying is, the affix, the mezuzah to the doorposts and the gates of your house. Deuteronomy 6, verse 9. Deuteronomy 6, verse 9. And write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Okay? In verse 8, it says it's supposed to be a sign. The word for sign, the root word for the word sign in the scripture is the word mezuzah. That's where we get the word mezuzah from. It comes from scripture. It is a scriptural word. It is the root word, the sign to write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. So it's a twofold thing that we are supposed to do. The sign on our house that marks our house with the Word of God. If you live in an apartment, it should be on your door where you enter or exit entrance and exit. It doesn't have to be on every single door, okay? 
just on the entrance and exit, and that is found in the, the meanings of the word. The mezuzah is supposed to be also if you have a house and it has land and you have a gate to your property where the marker is, the sign or the symbol is also to be on the outer gate. So anybody who's coming into your property understands that your home is set on the word of God. Okay. The gates is also to be of the gates of the city. Okay, so people coming in understand that this is a marking that sets this place aside. These are our rules that we are to follow, and if you don't like those rules, don't come in. Okay, so here we keep the Sabbath holy, so if you want to work on the Sabbath, no, we don't. Because why? That mezuzah is on the gate of the city. The mezuzah is supposed to be on the gate of the marketplace, okay? So here, this is supposed to be affixed to our homes, to mark our homes, not just as a thing that, oh, it's a decoration. Well, all Jews did it. No, if you're not going to follow the commandments, take it off your house because it's abhorrent to God. You're marking your house so that Satan can find you, so that when all hell is breaking loose and the Nazis are looking for you, oh, well, we don't really follow those stuff, you know, we just put it on our house, you know. No, sign and symbol that is marking the homes of those who follow. So whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, as long as you're following God's commandment, the Word of God, who is Yeshua, the Word, you follow these signs and symbols. You're to put this on your house. You're mark your house with the Word of God. Mark your house. If it's an apartment, mark where your domicile is, your place of uh, where you rest, where you lay your head down. That's where you put it. If it's a room, that's where you put your mezuzah on. You mark your house pursuant with what God said here, here in category three. This is also the final of this category. Let's move on to the Brit Hadashah. Turn to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Verse 14. Revelation 22, verse 14. See, once you understand the beginning, you'll be under, able to understand the end. Because if you don't know the beginning, you have no idea what is being said here and who's going to be let into heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Revelation 22, 14 says, How blessed are those who wash their robes, that they have the right to eat from the tree of life and go through the gates into the city. Only those who keep the commandments will be able to eat from the tree of life, meaning that you're going to live forever. And then go into the in go through the gates into the city. Outside of heaven are those that don't want to follow the commandments. But those that believe in the commandments, follow the commandments, then you get to enter in to Jehovah's house. Okay? Outside are the drug users, the homosexuals, the sexually immoral. Inside are those to go through the gates. Now, what would be on the gates? If, the, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what's going to be on that gate? It is going to be the mezuzah. It is going to be a sign of God's house. Because why? Because He never changes. He never makes a new covenant. So what's going to be on that gate to His house where you're going to be able to eat from the tree of life? The mezuzah, the commandments of God. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. You are echad with him. You're in unity with the word of God. Then you get to eat from the tree of life. Then you get to go and live in his house. Amazing. But if you did not know what was on the gate, you're thinking, well, I'll just claim me on the blood of Jesus on me. You ain't going to be able to go in. Because one, you're not marking your house with the word of God that God said you're to mark your house with the, the mezuzah. So you're not going to be able to enter into his house because you don't care about his commandments. You, you believe Satan. You think we don't have to follow these things. Well, good luck with that. But on God's house, we see here Yeshua telling Yochanan, John, 
go through the gates into the city. What's going to be on that gate? The mezuzah. Going on to category number four. Category number four is completed. We completed prayer and blessing last week. So that category is complete. Category number four of 34 is complete. Going on to the next slide, we are going to go to category number five, love and brotherhood. We're going to be turning to Leviticus, Viacra 19, verse 18. Leviticus, Viacra 19, verse 18. Love and brotherhood, not to take revenge. That is the subcategory. Leviticus 19, verse 18. Hopefully, like I said, you're learning from these teachings. I think that God's commandments are wonderful. It is the way we should live our lives. And if we start living our lives like this, then the evil people that do not believe in God will have no power. And the power will be given back to the body of Messiah. But the body of Messiah does not have power because they don't want to follow these perfect commandments. If you don't want to follow your commanding officer, then you have no power. You're a platoon that has no, nothing. No weapon. You have a paper armor. But if you follow God's commandments, He will defend you. He will give us power. Leviticus 19, verse 18. This is love and brotherhood, subcategory, not to take revenge. Don't take vengeance on or bear a grudge against any of your people. Rather, love your neighbor as yourself. I am Jehovah. Now, the good question was asked of Yeshua when he was sitting at Kepha's house. The question was, well, who is my neighbor? And Yeshua said, those who do the will of my Father. So with that in mind, since Yeshua is in unity with the Father, we are, we are not to take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people. Rather, love your neighbor as yourself. I know it's sometimes difficult, especially sometimes like with us, we spend a fair amount of time on Shabbat until generally 8 p.m. with the brotherhood. And sometimes you don't really mesh well with some others. But you have to find commonality that we both love Messiah. We both love God. And we're both at di maybe in different levels in our walk. But God says don't take vengeance or bear a grudge. This is one of the hardest things about Messianic ministries. In Israel, a lot of the congregations are a lot older than this one. Yes, this congregation started 2,000 years ago, but this form of this particular congregation started a little over a decade ago. And a, a lot of people come and go. And it takes some time getting used to, but if your focus is the one who paid the price on the cross, then you could serve them and love them and don't bear a grudge because maybe they don't know. But if you are following God and you want to do everything possible to receive your blessings, then God says don't take vengeance. Even if somebody wrongs you, well, how many times do I need to forgive him? Seventy times seven, says Yeshua. So don't bear a grudge. I know that's very hard, especially with a lot of people that come to this particular congregation that are Latin. One of the things they hold dear to them, and I think that's one of the reasons their, their societies have not been raised up in many capacities is because they constantly hold grudges, don't talk to people. I'll talk to anybody in my family. It's not me that's holding a grudge. I hold nothing against my family. I only want to bring them the Word of God. It's they who are holding grudges. But I'm blessed. Okay? It's people that hold grudges. God takes away their blessing. Now let's see about this vengeance part. This vengeance. Let's see if this is found in the Brit Honda shop. Turn to Romans 12. Romans 12. Verse 17, Romans, Romanos, Romans 12, verse 17. We're going to see about, should we take vengeance, okay, or not? Is this, now, if we're not under the law anymore, then we should take vengeance. That person wronged me, I get to beat them in the face. Or, is the law still in effect? So you can't have it both ways. Saying, we don't need the Sabbath anymore, we can do whatever day we want because God knows what's in my heart. Well, then vengeance, let's see if it's there, and then I'll come back to it. Romans 12, verse 17. Romans 12, verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but try to do whatever, what anyone regards as good. Let me read that again. Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but try to do 
what everyone regards as good. Okay? So what God regards as good, this is what we should do. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not take vengeance. But if we're not under the law anymore, Paul, then I can repay evil for evil. Okay? Well, what is Paul doing? No, Paul is saying he's a rabbi. And he's not condemning the law. He's not breaking the law. He's actually confirming the law. So if he's going to confirm this, he can't then say, well, you can eat whatever you want just because you know, don't, don't, it's, oh, well, it's an idol. No. You can't have it both ways. You can't say some of the laws are still there and some of the laws are not. See, this is where you get wrapped up and where a secular Satanist could really beat you over the head with the Word of God. This is where a homosexual can cut down the Christian and the Messianic that doesn't follow the Word. Okay? You keep the law, so here, repay no one evil for evil. Why is he saying that? Because he's quoting from the Leviticus scripture that we just read. Don't take vengeance on your neighbor. Leave that up to God. Okay, why is it? so in here in Romans, he's telling the Messianic congregation at Rome, don't pay no one evil for evil. He's paraphrasing the law. This is what a lot of his writings are all about. Paul's writings, Rav Shaul's writings that people don't understand. There wasn't a, you know, lots of Torah scrolls around. There were some, a good amount, but everybody didn't have a Bible in their home, nor did anybody have the book of Ephesians, only the Ephesians had the book of Ephesians or the letter of the, the Ephesians. Okay? So what he's doing, he's paraphrasing because he's trying to train up leaders and tell them in a, actually a handwritten note. Okay? And they didn't have real good erasers back then either, nor a ream of paper that you would buy from Staples or Office Depot or wherever you get your paper from. It was more difficult. Okay? So he's paraphrasing things, teaching new leaders in a baby congregation, what to do. Going on to the next category, we're going to back to Leviticus 19 again. Leviticus 19, we're going to category 6, the poor and unfortunate. Not to gather the olah, the imperfect clusters, on the vineyard. Poor and unfortunate, unfortunate. Leviticus 19, verse 10. Leviticus 19, verse 10. Leviticus 19, verse 10. Hopefully you're learning something in this teaching. It is quite amazing, the words of God. And I think we should keep them because God says we should keep them. And if you want to go and eat that tree of life, you better keep them too. Leviticus 19, verse 10. Likewise, don't gather the grapes left on the vine or fallen on the ground after the harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am Jehovah, your Elohim. So here what God is saying, if you've collected enough after the harvest, don't go back. Don't go back and go get them. What, he, what he's saying, as I fix this tali, because I put it on wrong tonight, what he's saying here is leave those things for those that don't have much. Leave them because they're imperfect, because what you were giving was the perfect. Okay? So what God is saying here is leave those other parts because they're imperfect. And somebody might be poor for many different reasons, but it might be that God is trying to get their attention. There are a lot of people that like to play games with God. I know a few people that are getting whacked around by God because God knows our hearts, and He knows how evil they are. And He knows how lazy we are. So he tries to get their attention, and this is why we have poor. Because God says, you won't be poor if you follow his ways. So there are certain people that are poor, maybe because two or three generations ago that their great-grandfather cursed the Jewish people, and God says for the third and fourth generation. You'll be saved, but you might be a poor person because God will not allow you up because of his word. So here what he's saying is... Don't be the judge of who's poor or why they're poor. You just because I blessed you, because you followed me, I brought the right amount of rain, I brought the right amount of sun, leave those imperfect things for the poor. Let them have a blessing. And then maybe they'll come to you and say, well, why are you being blessed? See, our job is to follow God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then others, he said, would come to us and say, why are you so blessed? Why are you leaving this for us? And you can witness them and say, listen, 
I was like you, but I decided to follow the word in spirit and in truth. So here, take these. These were imperfect. I couldn't give them to God. So he said, give them to you. So he provided for you because he loves you also and he wants you to follow his commandments. Now, let's see if we find that in the Brit Hanasha. Turn to Galatians chapter 2, please. Galatians chapter 2, we're on slide number 15. Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 10. We're also, once again, talking about the poor. We're tying this together with Leviticus 19. We're now looking at Galatians 2. Once again, you see the Torah coming, you will see the Torah coming through with clarity once you know what you're looking at. Once you've been trained, you'll know what you're looking at. People are not trained or only can read a line or only quote a word or two from the Bible. They're not trained and they don't know how to train others. Galatians 2 verse 10, their only request was that we should remember the poor, which everything I have spared no pains to do. Remember the poor. How am I going to remember the poor? Oh, I'm leaving those grapes that come up after the harvest, the ones that ripen after the harvest. Oh, I'm remembering the poor. Why? Because God said so. So here, Paul is now talking to the Messianic congregation at Galatia and telling them to remember the poor. How do we remember the poor? Not the way man wants to, but the way God commands us to. By feeding them, by leaving the grapes, leaving the imperfect stuff, leaving the stuff that's hit the ground for the poor and unfortunate. Following what God says, and then God will bless. See, the closer you get to the Word. But, you know, if we're not under the law anymore, forget that. We don't need to remember the poor. Forget those bums. They, they, were, they were saying God was bad anyway. Forget them. No. But see, we are under God's ways. And He blesses us when we show His mercy to others by following His commandments in spirit and in truth. Going on to the next slide, Category 7, we are also finishing this category tonight. Deuteronomy 23, Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. This is the category, Treatment of the Gentiles. See, there's a whole category with Treatment of the Gentiles. Okay? Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. To lend to an alien at interest. We're going to see the rules of who we can charge interest to. Okay? Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. Devarim, Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. We are in category 7 of 34. This is also a final of this category. Okay, you see how it's taken us 13 cycles to get around to finishing some of the categories. Devarim 23, verse 21. Deuteronomy 23, 21. To an outsider you may lend at interest, but to your brother you are not to lend at interest. So that Yehovah your Elohim will prosper you in everything you set out to do in the land you are entering in order to take possession of it. Okay, so it's very interesting in this business practice and in the Gentiles that don't want to follow the commandment, okay, we can lend to an outsider. Well, who's an outsider? Well, who's an insider? First of all, who's an insider? Who is my neighbor? Those who do the will of the Father. So to an outsider, those who are not doing the will of the Father, so those who are not keeping the Sabbath, those who are Sunday worshipers, I can charge much interest to. Those who are doing secular holidays, such as New Year's, okay, I can charge interest to. Those who are doing pagan holidays and calling it Christianity, like Christmas or Easter, I can charge double to, because why? They're an outsider. They are not doing the will of the Father. We do not find Christmas in the Bible. We do not find Easter in the Bible. So there, that, therefore, by that criteria, you are an outsider. You will not be going into the gates of heaven or eating from the tree of life because you did not unfollow the words of God. So you are classified by God's word as an outsider, 
So if I lend you money, if I lend you $100, I can tell you you need to pay me back $150. And if you don't, then I can take you to jail, okay, and take you to court and take all your money because you were supposed to give me mine back, okay? But to one who is an insider, who would be an insider, those who do the will of my father, says Yeshua. Those are my brothers and sisters, okay? Now, do we see this in the Brit Hanashah that we can charge interest to the outsider? Let's see. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Can I lend at interest in the Brit HaDashah? In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Category 7 of 34, Treatment of Gentiles in the Brit HaDashah in the New Testament. So, my dear brothers, stand firm and immovable, always doing the Lord's work as vigorously as you can, knowing that united with the Lord, your efforts are not in vain. So, if I am standing firm and immovable on God's word, I can lend still at interest to those who are not keeping the Sabbath holy. Those who do a couple hours of Sabbath and then go to the diner, I can lend at interest with them because they are not doing the will of the Father. Because the Father says, keep the Sabbath holy, don't cook on the Sabbath. Okay? So I can charge them interest because why? They may say they're Jews, but they're really not. Because a Jew is one who worships the Lord in spirit and truth. So here, Rav Shaul, the Paul, Paul the emissary, is saying, brothers. Well, who's my brother? Those who do the will of my Father, says Yeshua. Stand firm and immovable. So here, I'm standing firm on the Word of God. I can tr charge you interest. Why? Because the Word says so. I'm standing firm on that. Very interesting. But if we're not under, under law anymore, then we can't do it. But since we are, you can. Going on to the next category, category number 8. Turn to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23, Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. We're looking at marriage, divorce, and family. Okay, so here we're talking in this specific one, Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. We're talking about family. Okay, uh, that a eunuch shall not marry the daughter of Israel. Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. A mamzer may not enter the assembly of Yehoah, nor may his descendants down to the tenth generation enter the assembly of Yehovah. Okay? So a mamzer, in the English, is a bastard. Somebody who doesn't know their father. May not marry the daughter of Israel. Why? Because they don't know who the lineage line is. He may not enter the assembly of Yehovah, nor his descendants down to the tenth Generation, well, that's pretty harsh, Lord. That's pretty harsh. Well, let's see if that's found in the Brit Hadashah. Turn to Hebrews. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Let's see how this plays out. This Mamzer is a bastard. Bastard doesn't know whose father is. Hebrews 12, verse 8. We're on the next slide. Hebrews 12, verse 8. Give you a second to find that. Hopefully you're learning some real interesting stuff. Now, if you're going to lend an interest, remember, this is also to an effect. You can't pick and choose what you want to do. You either follow God wholeheartedly or you don't follow God at all. Because why do the, some of the work and not get paid in the end because you won't, get, won't be able to eat from that tree of life? Because you didn't put the mezuzah on the door. Hebrews 12, verse 8. All legitimate sons undergo discipline. So if you don't, you're a mamzer and not a son. If you don't go undergo discipline, if you're not following God the way He wants you to follow, so that you don't, you're a bastard, the Lord is saying. A mamzer. You're not a son. So if you don't want to follow God's ways, you're not getting into heaven. You're a bastard, He says. Okay? Because you don't know who your father is. And if you know the Father, 
you know Yeshua, you have known the Father. Interesting concept. Because what did Thomas say? Well, show us the Father. And Yeshua says, what? You have seen me. You have seen the Father. So you are not a bastard if you go undergo the discipline of following the word, which goes all the way back to putting the mezuzah on the door. Going on to category 9. Category 9. We're now turn, going to Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18, verse 11. Going to the next slide. Leviticus 18, verse 11. We're talking about forbidden sexual relations. Okay, there's always this category. And as I've said in the past, while doing this category, we do not shy away from the Word of God. So if these things make you embarrassed or you can't hear to talk about them, well, you know what? It's God's Word and He has rules and we need to talk about the rules. We need to teach these rules to our children so they don't get misled by, you know, the LGBT, EI, EIO freaks. Okay? And if they don't like me using that term, well, follow somebody else or somebody else's teachings. Because I preach straightforwardly the Word of God. Okay? I'm not going to be nice to those who don't want to follow my Father's commandments. Okay? It's that simple. Leviticus 18, verse 11. Forbidden sexual relations, not to commit incest with one's father's wife's daughter. It's fascinating. You are not to have sexual relations with your father's wife's daughter. Born to your father because she is your sister, do not have sexual relations with her. Okay? Now, the most fascinating thing I always find about the Lord writing this is it must have been going on. And we'll find out in the Brit Hadashah that it was. Okay? It, it is amazing that this is happening in our world today. A lot of this stuff goes on, especially here in America, with a lot of these blended families, with women and men getting married and remarried and married and married and remarried. And, and you know, you have children from two marriages or three marriages living together under the same roof and kids just doing because our school systems promote sexual activity in such a high level. You have exactly this stuff going on. You're not to have sexual relations with your father's wife's daughter. The father's wife, that means she's not your biological mother. Okay, so let's just say she's two or three marriages in She's got a daughter that's like around your same age and you know, you're home alone with your sister and she's really, you don't think she's really your sister and she's a hot tamale and there things happen, okay? The Lord is saying don't do this. It is forbidden, okay? Even though she's not, she's your, just your half sister, okay? And she's sort of really not even blood because she's your father's wife's daughter, okay, well, she's sort of a half-sister, weird thing is, but unfortunately, this is going on, and let's see if it was going on in the Brit Hadashah, going on to the next slide, turn to Romans 13, Romans 13, Romans 13, verse 13, so if you say we're under grace and we don't have to follow the law anymore, hey, this one's for you. Checkmate. You can't say you, we don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore because Jesus rose on Sunday and say that this is wrong. This is where Satan loves to play and this is why the body is getting so torn apart because we don't follow the simple truths of the Word of God. We like to pick and choose. Romans 13, but unfortunately this has been going on for 2,000 years. Romans 13, verse 13, let us live properly as people do in the daytime, not partying and getting drunk, not engaging in sexual immorality and other excesses, not quarreling and being jealous. What would be sexual immorality? Having sex with your father's wife's daughter, amongst other things that we've read about. Okay? That's what sexual immorality would be is doing exactly what God said do not do. Very simple. We're to keep God's law. You can't say this is right and eating pig is okay. Can't have it both ways. It's very simple. 
Going on to category 10. Category 10, we're going to Deuteronomy 6. Teen, 16. Okay? Times and seasons rejoice on the festivals. We're going to be talking about something happy. Category 10 of 34, times and seasons. We're in Deuteronomy 16, verse 14. Deuteronomy 16, verse 14. Hopefully you're learning something beautiful. We've got a few more minutes to go. And we'll see if uh, our sister congregation in the Philippines is there to take some questions. And if you have any questions, just write an email to info at bethgoim.org. I'll be happy to try to get to your questions. And generally, it takes me about a week to get to back to people now. Sorry for taking so long, but things are growing. And there's a lot of wonderful people asking a lot of very good questions. Deuteronomy 16, verse 14. Rejoice at your festival, you, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, the litvaim and the foreigners, the goyim, orphans and widows living among you. Amen? So here, rejoicing. We're looking at rejoicing. But who gets to rejoice? Everybody, the Jew and the Gentile, the slaves and the free, are to rejoice at God's festival. Because it's a time where he is set aside to call everybody. So every Shabbat, that's a festival. It's a Kadosh Mikra. It's a holy convocation. Pesach, holy convocation. Bikarim, holy convocation. Shavuot, the holy convocation. And you can name all seven, okay? It's rejoice. Everybody rejoice, be happy, because this is a time that God is setting aside. Even beyond the sh weekly Shabbat, these are other times that God wants to rejoice with His people who rejoice in His time. Now let's see if we find this rejoicing in the Brit Hadashah. Of course we do. Turn to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Philippians? Talking about the holy days? Yes. Philippians 3, verse 1 and 2. Philippians 3, Philippians, the Messianic congregations at Philippi. Remember, they're not churches, they are congregations. Kehilat, these are Jews, are Messianic, meaning they believe in Messiah, welcoming in the Gentiles to worship in spirit and in truth. And we'll see this through Philippians 3. Verse 1 and 2, Philippians 3, verse 1 and 2. In conclusion, my brothers, Rejoice in union with the Lord. It is no trouble for me to repeat what I have written you before. And for you, it will be a safeguard. Beware of the dogs, those evildoers, uh, the mutilated. Now, first we look at verse 1. Rejoice in union. What do you mean rejoice? Rejoice, what, Shabbat and the seven holy days? Yes, that would be in union. In this union with the Lord would be Sunday and Easter and Christmas. And if you can't bear to hear that, it's better for you to hear it now than to hear it in heaven when the Lord says, I don't know you. Okay, you dog. Okay, and the Lord, you know, and a lot of people get a little aggravated with me calling the Muslims dogs and cockroaches. Paul just called people, beware of dogs. He's not talking about a dog that's going to bite your heel or nip at your ankle. He's talking about people. He's calling them dogs. Okay? Well, because Messiah called the woman a dog. Okay? So we follow Messiah's example. You've got to call things what they are. Things need title. But let's go to rejoicing. Rejoice in union with Yeshua. Going on to category 11. Next slide. Category 11. Turn it into Deuteronomy 14. We're looking at the dietary laws. To examine the marks of a fowl so as to distinguish the clean from the unclean. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11. About another five more minutes will be completed with this particular lesson. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11. Like I said, if you're watching this on the replay, you can go to our website. You can download the PowerPoint. If you find it to be a help to you, please hit the donate button and help to keep the ministry going because we'll be able to produce more. And we're working on getting them in Spanish also. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11. You may eat any clean bird. Okay, well, what is clean? Well, in, in Leviticus 11, since Deuteronomy is a synopsis of the other four books, you 
we're told what the category, the criteria for clean. Any bird that has a hook beak is generally unclean. The hook beak is for ripping and eating flesh. So those are generally going to be birds that are unclean. Okay. So you may may eat any clean bird. So a chicken doesn't have a hook beak. Hence, it is a clean bird. Chickens eat seed and worms and things like that. Okay. They don't eat flesh unless you're giving it to them in their feed, and that's why a lot of health problems are occurring. So here, dietary laws. Do we see them in the Brit Hadashah? Going on to the next slide, turn to Revelation 3. Revelation 3, verse 20. Revelation 3, verse 20. That's a very interesting parallel that we're going to join, uh, put together here. Revelation 3, verse 20 talking about dietary laws. We're going to see that the dietary laws are still in place in the New Testament and even to the very end. Revelation 3 verse 20, Revelation 3 verse 20, here I'm standing at the door knocking. If someone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he will eat with me. But what Yeshua, who is one with the Father, What's he going to eat with you? Is he going to eat pig? Is he going to eat unclean birds with you? No. If he's knocking at your door, he's going to tell you how to be clean. When you let him in, you let out the junk. So he's going to, going to eat with you because he and the Father are one. They wrote Leviticus 11. They just read De Deuteronomy. What is a clean bird? What are the criteria for it? He's going to eat with you, and you're going to eat with him. Going on to our final category for tonight, business practices, turning to Exodus 22. Exodus 22. To lend to a poor person, business practices. Exodus 22, verse 24. This is category 12 of 34. This will be the last two slides that we're going to be doing for this evening. Exodus 22, verse 24. Exodus 22, verse 24. If you loan money to one of my people who is poor, you are not to deal with him as you would a creditor. You are not to charge him interest. Who is his people? Those who do the will of the Father. So if somebody's poor... Give them criteria, okay? You got to pay back by this amount of time, or you can become a slave. You don't have the money to pay back, but you don't. The business practice of a Jew, of a Torah observant Jew, is to not lend at interest to somebody who is in the family, okay? Not lend at interest. But if he's a Gentile, whoo, who's not following the word of God, hey, charge him interest. But the Lord is saying, don't. Somebody's poor, lend, and, you know, they got to pay it back, but not with interest. And you can make up rules where, you know, when they got to pay it back. Be specific, okay? Now, is this found in the Brit Hadashah? The last slide we're going to tonight. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 27 and 28. Matthew 25, verse 27 and 28. If you missed any part of this, you can always go back and on our website and click on the 613 icon. And, and you can even get it for your, your phone. We have an app for our, your phone. So go to bethgoyim.org on your phone. If you have a smartphone and Android, you can download our app to your phone. And then go to 613 and watch it on your phone. Matthew 25, verse 27 and 28, we're talking about lending to a poor person. Then you should have deposited my money with the bankers so that I would when I returned, I would at least gotten back interest with my capital. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten. This is a, Yeshua talking about lending money to people. He just gave them money. You were supposed to do something with the talent. You were supposed to do something with that amount of money. But the one guy didn't do anything. He just buried it and he said, you're a hard man. I just put it in the dirt. And Yeshua says, well, you should have did something with my money because I lent it to you to do something with and you did nothing so this angered me so 
Here, Yeshua is following the proper business practices. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. If you have any questions, write to info at bethgoim.org. I bid you an amen and an amen, 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 amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M dot org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. That Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture. Truly, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend a day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures, searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our King's Word. We close this Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. 
If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and Biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.